Uh, hey everyone, so I'm Chris Galley, part of the U Ottawa Research Group. Um, and we're bringing in the geophysics perspective uh, to the modern or Metal Oceans uh, project. Um, sort of see here the sort of co-researchers part of the project. You have the U Ottawa group, but also uh, Michael King from Memorial and Pierre Liliev that uh, put together pretty much the program that I use um, for the inversion modeling, who's a prof now at Mount Allison. Uh, here are the partners we have, software used. Uh, and sort of the objective of the project is to use geophysics to figure out where these microplate boundaries are that Mark just talked about, um, and doing it using uh, inversion modeling of, of gravity data to produce 3D density models. Um, and from this density model, we can pull out crustal structure uh, and MOHO topography. Uh, Mark pr introduces pretty well already, um, but using the Lao Basin as a case study to be able to identify where these rifts are, uh, to then apply the same sort of modeling methodology in the Abitibi um, to identify these areas. Um, and how this is done is uh, the rifts are formed sort of through extension, and, and as this occurs, you get this, this sort of thinning, so you get this little uh, raise in, in the mantle, also a thin the upper crust. And then through compression, the sort of stuff that would have happened in the abitibi, you can get imbrication uh, and fracturing in the upper crust where it's more brittle, but down in the base of the crust where it's been shown to be more ductile in the abitibi, this feature seems to be preserved. So you can sort of preserve, it will be deformed, amplitude will change, um, so that you can get these, these sort of little upticks uh, in, in the Moho topography that we'll use to identify where these sort of extensional rifts uh, would have existed. Um, so as shown here, sort of the, uh, from Ben, the uh, lithoprobe cross section, sort of if you have the fracture in the upper crust, it gets more ductile, and then you have the lower crust that doesn't really have any sort of thrusting or any sort of major deformation that would have messed up these, um, these sort of features in the Moho topography. Uh, use gravity data. So this is the gravity data set from the GSC. Um, density of the data points varied quite a bit. So there was really dense data around, you know, Chippewa, uh, Blake River. We thinned it so that it's about minimum five kilometers uh, spacing. So most of that thinning happened in around here. The rest of the data was already at this, this sort of thinning, just bring it in a bit more uniform. Uh, and then use an inversion modeling program to turn this into a density model of the, uh, of the Abitibi. Um, and then much like the MOHO is a uh, velocity interface um, in seismic models, uh, it's also a density interface uh, in, in uh, density models. So by extracting a isolayer from the 3D density model, you can get this MOHO surface. Um, this sort of modeling uh, isn't new. I did my PhD at Memorial, so I was exposed to Dr. Kim Welford's work, who does this quite a bit in rifted margins, um, sort of in the marine environment, uh, putting together 3D density models, extracting the isosurface to get um, the MOHO surface, and then from that, crustal thickness, um, using satellite gravity data. But this sort of data modeling has been done all around the world, so the, ex the extreme case where we have a crustal thickness model for the entire world. Uh, this is the crust 1.0 model, um, coarse resolution, but global coverage. Uh, we also have other ancient trains, so you know, Yilgarn uh, in Australia, you have Africa, you have South America. So there's other regions where you've had gravity data used to create uh, MOHO topography models, and then through that they can get crustal thickness. Um, but really what we're trying to do is work in a much finer scale uh, and actually be able to pick out where some of these boundaries are as opposed to looking at overall thickness um, of, of throughout the continental scale. Um, some of the, the differences between the modeling we do and the modeling that has been done, sort of the example here with uh, this um, Australian model, um, is sort of the assumptions that are put into it. Uh, Richard Smith mentioned that um, gravity modeling can be pretty non-unique. Uh, so there can be a number of different models that can be used to explain the same data set. Uh, so steps need to be taken to sort of limit this non-uniqueness. Um, constraints uh, get introduced. Uh, in, in this area where you have uh, pretty large models, a pretty classic constraint is you assume homogeneity through blocks of the crust. So there'd be constant density upper crust, constant density the lower crust, uh, for the mantle, oceanic crust, or these, these constant density layers, and then it's the thickness of the layers that are solved for. Uh, and that sort of makes it a bit more computationally feasible. Uh, where we uh, improve on thing is we allow for complexity throughout the crust. So we don't assume there are fixed 
uh, densities. We instead solve for distribution of density through a number of cells. So this is uh, sort of the, the mesh, it's called, of the abatibi, so sort of just the skeleton. Uh, and then density values were solved for iteratively inside each of these cells uh, through the inversion process. Um, and then by getting sort of that smooth uh, distribution of density throughout the whole abatibi by uh, modeling density inside each of these cells, you can then extract the isoservice of the, the MOHO. See here you can just see, I'll of course show a better image later on, but you can see the outline of the abatibi, Grenville front, campus casing uplift zone. Um, so it accounts for the densities you'd expect to see between plutons and volcanic rocks uh, while still being able to model uh, the MOHO. Big step here, because of course you still have to uh, limit your non-uniqueness is we use the lithoprobe transects to constrain. So it was constrained against the seismic cross-sections um, that pretty much ran north-south through the Abitibi. Um, and with that constraint, we were able to produce this model. Um, before jumping right into the Abitibi, we did a case study in the Lao Basin. Mark talked about this a little bit. Um, bottom sea floor being great because we can see where these rifts are. So this is a check that if we put together in this case, crustal thickness, but it's also reflective of the, the MOHO topography. So if you put together this sort of MOHO model um, and check where you have zones of, in this case, it's described as crustal thinning, but it can also be thought of where the MOHO is shallow. So where you have shallowings of the MOHO is where you have rifting and seafloor spreading. And we can check that because you can see it in the seafloor. So by making sure that the modeling process worked here uh, in the Lao Basin, we were then able to continue it on through. Um, one of the checks that we uh, did is, because this 3D density models to make sure that the, what you're getting for the, the MOHO topography isn't just a reflection of the density. More specifically, is it just anywhere you have low density crust? Is that also where you have uh, deep sections of the MOHO? Um, and that isn't the case. Certainly it looks like it here where you have the, the more felsic um, Lao Ridge and the Tonga Ridge, it's thick. Um, then you can even see up here where you have uh, massive uh, mafic volcanic flows very thick crust. You have mantle material circling in around the Pacific plate here, introducing heat at the bottom of the plate, producing a whole bunch of milk, thickening the crust. But this, uh, this crust is high density. You see a high density crust there. I suppose the down in the south where it's quite thin, but this is all rifted arc. So it's lower density, but can still be thin. So the model can account for low density, thin crust, as well as uh, high density, thick crust, uh, and, and all the bits in between. The two main products that you use to, to visualize the 3D density model um, is just looking at the plan view density at the surface. This is sort of the outcropping density uh, throughout the epitibi. Uh, and then also the, the, so the MOHO surface. So both of these can kind of be looked at as plan, through, uh, plan view maps. Uh, looking at the density, so here's the, the epitibi map just here on the right, density on the left. So high density red, low density blue. Uh, you can see this mostly reflects uh, location of plutons that are lower density, uh, and then you're left with sort of the higher density volcanics between. But there's still some variability. You see where some of the, um, the ultramafics uh, are, you have higher densities as you might expect, but there's even some variation like you see sort of in the lower Blake River appears to be higher density than the upper. Some of the Stout and Rookmore is higher density. So there's still some variations through the different volcanic belts. Here then to look at a bit more of what's going on in the subsurface, put together a cross section that passes through Naranda and Metagamy, sort of the, the northern and southern volcanic, um, volcanic belts in the Abitibi. Uh, and this is this density uh, cross section here. So still red high density, blue low density. You have the Pontiac, Blake River crosses in through to Metagamy and then uh, Paddock at the end. And you can see that there is this variability in the MOHO topography. Um, for the sake of visualization, it would just be solid red, just so you can, I adjusted the color maps, so you can see variation in the crust, and then just removed the high density of the mantle underneath. So this black line represents where the, the, um, the MOHO is. Now really, the more geophysics you can bring in, uh, the better you can explain what's happening in the crust. The, uh, density really isn't the, the be-all, end-all for, for getting information on this, so it's useful. Um, in Taus's publication, he um, published Eric Root's 3D Southern Abitibi MT model, so he could use this to produce cross-sections through to match, match the uh, cross-section. And what you could see from both of these, oh, and then here's a five times vertical exaggeration of the Moho, just to sort of help see where you have zones of, of thick crust, uh, sorry, where you have deep, uh, deep Moho versus shallow Moho. 
Um, but looking at the crustal structures, there are two, two uh, main things you can see throughout the crust um, by sort of going back and forth between the MT and the density. The MT is great because you can see uh, sort of these major fault zones that act as pathways for, for fluids that come up, these high conductivity fluids. So you can see sort of here the Porcupine Duster Fault and Letter Lake Cadillac bounding uh, Blake River, sort of marking where you have the more brittle crust on top. Um, you don't quite see where it gets down into more ductile, but you can see this a bit more in the density where you have this sharp drop of where you have more vertical features or from the imprecation uh, through the upper crust to the flat mafic lower crust occurring in there just above the, um, above the moho. At about a similar crust, uh, thickness to what you see in the lithbrope sections, about maybe 10 kilometers to the lower crust and then information on the upper crust from the, uh, for the MT there. And then some th interesting features you can see is then by looking at where you have uh, these shallow zones in the Moho line up with underneath the uh, Blake River, underneath Naranda, and also Metagni, sort of the southern and northern volcanic zone, um, but offset a little bit. And you sort of see this, it was uh, shown really well in um, Mole's publication where, you know, southern and northern volcanic zones produced through extension. You had thinning, so sort of these uh, shallowings of the moho. But then as you compressed the uh, abitibi back in, you would have had sort of brittle uh, thrusting um, going on in the upper crust, but then more ductile um, compression in the lower crust. And in the end, you'd actually shift the, uh, the upper crustal features southward compared to their sort of corresponding lower crustal features where they used to be vertically stacked. And you see this in the density model, that there's sort of this little offset, a uh, northward offset to where you have these high anomalies in the, uh, in the moho compared to the um, sort of these, these uh, volcanic zones. And then here's just a little comparison to one of the, the sections. Mark showed this, just a different view. There's no vertical exaggeration uh, this time here. Uh, it's a cross section through the um, uh, a spreading center in the Lao Basin. So here, following the same convention, this is the, the density model uh, and an MT model. Uh, you see similar features. So you see upper crustal fracturing, sort of marking the, the edges of, uh, of the rift basin. So here, fluids are able to flow through, raising the, the conductivity. Um, but then, of course, just the major differences is in the modern seafloor, you can have these large-scale fractures come right down to the moho, whereas you can't, or you don't see that in the, um, in the Archean where it keeps more to the, to, the, to the more shallow, brittle upper crust. But similarities nonetheless in seeing these conductivity anomalies bound these volcanic zones. Um, uh, but you're not limited just to looking at uh, the sort of the, the moho depth um, in just a cross section. This is a cross section you're just looking at, but it's in fact uh, a whole surface that was extracted from the 3D model. So here you can see that thinning that you saw through Blake River, uh, through Metagamy, but there's also thinning up through um, sort of under like uh, Kid Creek here, Swayze, Chibugamu, uh, Valdor. So all these areas where you have um, a lot of VMS, you uh, are observing thinning. Uh, to sort of help make sense of, so you have sort of like these east-west thinning features going on, but you have this bit more strange looking uh, southwest, northeast uh, angled um, feature of, of raised moho, and, and I think this can be explained when you take into account that there's been uh, shearing that has occurred during the Abitibi uh, deformation, so you've had sort of uh, compression and shearing. So this is just an extremely first order cartoon uh, of, sh of showing, but if you sort of reverse the shearing a little bit, this uh, southwest, northeast feature will actually straighten up more. How much the degree, I'm not quite sure, but it ends up when you reverse the shearing it becomes a bit more of what you expect of uh, sort of models of um, uh, mantle plume induced uh, extension uh, in, in oceanic plates um, from numerical modeling where you're going to have these circular islands of thickened crust surrounded by zones of, um, of, of crustal thinning, in this case represented by shallow zones of, of the moho. And you can put the VMS on this now. So you have VMS form in these ex uh, extensional environments. Um, so then you'd think that these, uh, if these shallow areas, the moho represent extensional environments, you'd see the VMS appear along them. Uh, and that's what we mainly observe. Again, you can see most VMS are aligning along these zones where you have uh, crustal thinning. There are some in areas where it appears like you have sort of thickened crust or, or, or deep moho. 
Um, I think, again, sort of calling on models that we have of the, the modern seafloor, um, you don't only have hydrothermal systems along spreading centers. You do get some in thickened volcanic crust, but these are the small VMS. Uh, they don't, not as long lived, they're not big, uh, and not as numerous. So most of the, the VMS you'll produce in modern seafloor from what we've seen are along these rifts and spreading centers. Uh, and that's sort of what we appear to be seeing through, through the Apatipi here. Uh, and then just a little uh, other schematic here to help represent that where you see uh, this histogram of um, what the, the moho depth is below each of the VMS points and it is lo mostly lying in uh, sort of the thin, thin crust or, or more shallow moho. Um, yeah, so then sort of another uh, takeaway you can look at is then looking at the geologic map is it becomes a bit more apparent that not all of the uh, uh, volcanic assemblages lie in these zones where you have shallow moho. Uh, and I think this sort of helps explain why you don't necessarily see VMS in all of the um, assemblages, especially the Stout and Rookmore. If you look here, the Stout and Rookmore lies quite a bit in the middle where you have this deep moho, sort of this, this sort of thick and crust area. So not as much uh, VMS because you don't have as much extension occurring as opposed to in Blake River and, and, and Deloro and these other areas where it appears that you've had more extension occurring. So there's more VMS production. Uh, so just in conclusion, uh, to help identify where sort of these microplate boundaries are uh, or there are these zones of extension or rifting, uh, we use 3D uh, inversion modeling, produce a density model, and you can extract the, the Moho topography through that. Uh, use the Lao Basin as a proxy just to make sure that we can, what we're seeing in the Moho topography is representative of, of rifts. Um, and then, yeah, this, the, the Lao Basin paper is uh, submitted now. Um, Abbot to be one draft is done, it's on its way, and then begun modeling now of doing the same sort of moho modeling uh, in the Wabagoon, then to see what this would look like um, in less endowed environments. Thank you.